Can someone please try the streaming link and tell me if it's streaming my desktop right now as I aimlessly click around? Because I'm bad at this. They move stuff in YouTube. I don't know where the things are now. Is it, is it working? Oh, okay. I just can't, I can't find the window that shows me, you know, that it's like live. Really? I mean, I just stopped moving my mouse. That's all. Oh, okay. Go live? No, because then this starts up some wacky thing. I don't, classic live streaming? Oh, that's the interface. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Hmm? Oh, really? Okay. Why is it not like the same link every time? That's ridiculous. I'm not, I don't have Discord open, so if somebody messages in Discord saying the volume is broken, um, could someone tell me, and I'll try to fix it. In the general chat? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I'll have the... Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you just watch for it. Cool. Okay, so, hi. How's it going? It's Friday. Woo, Friday. Hi. Um, so, I'm Nick. This is Adam. We're going to do some news. And then, after that, we're going to have a quick break, and then... We're going to solve some basic CTF challenges on the Ring Zero CTF contest board as a bit of an intro into how to do CTF contests in preparation for the upcoming club contest, which is going to be next Saturday, March the 16th, from some time in the morning until some time in the afternoon. The times are on the sign-up form. I don't know. Uh, Cameron knows. Start at 9. The actual competition will start at 10, and then I believe it runs until either 5 or 6. Probably five. Probably five is a good time to wrap it up. Yeah. Yeah. That's assuming we get our act together and finish building challenges in time, but I think we will. Cool. Yeah. I'm glad you are. I mean, not really. I'm trying to Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Being like, yes, we are in a very good position. Okay, yeah. Um, nice. So, yeah, here we go. Uh, news this week. Um, stuff that happened over the last two weeks in InfoSec. First off, I just, like, randomly saw this tweet on Twitter, and it kind of picked up with a bunch of InfoSec people commenting on it. So Tinkersec does pen testing for a living. And then, like, in the middle of the day, like, 1 p.m., he just randomly tweets, hey, as part of this pen test, I, I stole a domain controller. Like... I'm, I'm verbatim, like physically stole it. I have it here with me. So at that point, the rest of the thread is people telling him stuff he can do once he's <laughs> physically stolen a Windows domain controller from like a data center or a client site. Like normally the goal of a pen test is to break into one of these things over the network, but I guess he social engineered his way into the building and stole the box, yeah. which is amazing. So people were, um, throughout the day, giving him like scripts to run that would dump all of the Windows creds for all of the users on the network um, to basically just give them full control over everything. It's actually quite an interesting thread to see all people's suggestions of stuff you could do if you're actually able to lay hands on physical hardware that you're trying to pen test against. So, like, solid thread, really funny. Um, 
Yeah. Made his job a little easier by getting uh, physical access. Oh, like way, <laughs> way easier. There's yep. so much stuff you could do. So yeah, it's just just go scroll through it sometime. The links in the news link that I posted in Discord and on Twitter. Um, just scroll through it and read the answers. It's hilarious. Um, and that's like a mega score if you're doing a pen test. Mm -hmm. um, so that took some skill. Too. Yeah. Oh man, that's yeah. It's Google Linux, you're off to the races. Yeah. Uh, this past week was the RSA conference in uh, San Francisco, which is a big security conference that happens every year. Funny thing, RSA stands for Rivest, Shamir, and Alderman, the people, the three mathematicians that came up with the RSA encryption algorithm. Adi Shamir, who's the S in RSA, couldn't get the business visa to travel to the US for his own conference. Ah, uh, that's unfortunate. Like, that's really bad. Um, yeah, they're like apparently he applied for it like two months before and they just never got around uh, or maybe someone was like intentionally trying to not give him his um, entry visa so he couldn't appear on his own cryptographers panel. I think they set up like a live stream thing so he appeared and did a bit of a hello but like that's really unfortunate when you are not allowed to attend your own conference. Yeah. And that was, where's the conference? Uh, San Francisco. San Francisco? Okay. Yeah, because um, he teaches at uh, a university in Israel that does con like crazy security research. Like it's his PhD students that do the stuff that like from you know like a mile down the road they'll read the energy signatures off of your computer to figure out what your encryption keys are. Like just stupid stuff like that. That's really cool, and they wouldn't let him into the U.S. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Not the greatest. But yeah, no, it sucks to be him. <laughs> uh, so. First of two NSA stories this week. First off, they came out and said, hey, we don't need to do our phone spying program anymore on people's phones, so like less mass surveillance. So maybe because they have everything already? I don't know. Um, just a guess. I don't know. Maybe it's just not as useful as it once was. Maybe they have better agreements in place with Facebook. I don't know. They just don't need to tap our phones anymore. Um, yeah, we'll find out. Um, but... Uh, in addition to that, this week at RSA, they announced that they are making their reverse engineering tool free and eventually open source after they take out all the stuff that's not supposed to be in there um, to the public to use. So this is the tool. It's Ghidra. It's a Java-based reverse engineering tool. It's free to download. Um, there's a GitHub page for it. There's a project page that has some cheat sheets and stuff. If you were in my malware class this morning, you watched me spend a couple of hours just trying to fiddle my way through using this tool and setting up, setting it up and stuff. Um, it wasn't a complete nightmare of, of like an incident. It actually was okay. We were able to do a few things with it. It's actually a really nice looking tool. Um, here, I have like a few seconds, so let's, I'll show you. Uh, I think, yeah, and then... Uh, Run. Um, I am sold just on some of the animations in this thing. Uh, it's it's badass. Just just wait. So I'm gonna close that. Um, so I have like a little test binary file here that you can do animations on. To start it, you click this sick little dragon icon. But just watch. Boom! Like <laughs> see that? It just like hopped right up in my face. Like that was amazing. Um, and it's going to like load up the binary up eventually, unless I deleted it. I probably deleted it. Oops, here, let me import uh, the file really quick. Here's the file I want to use. Um, it says it's already there. Okay. Well, there's an interesting problem. I haven't actually tried like reopening a program that I had previously opened in this. Um, so there's a thing that I got to fix. But anyways, um, this is the interface, like this main big central window would show you the assembly. On the right, it shows you um, decompilation of that assembly. So it shows you like C-ish equivalent code in like real time. Um, on the left over here, we have some navigation to like list the functions in the program that you're disassembling and stuff. Um, and it seems to have a very like intuitive user interface, a lot of nice features. It's actually kind of cool, and I'm prob probably going to start using it in the malware class because it's free. Um, so it, that's how I like software. And it wasn't it interesting how um, last last two weeks ago we were talking about how the NSA was going to be more 
forward and open with the community, and then they release this. And they release this tool. So yeah. Maybe oh, there. Talk. Like, yeah. Look at that. That dragon was just chewing <laughs> up some binary. Here's the. Here's how it looks. Um, it's nice. I can get a um, like a call graph. Uh, if I was in main, I'm not in main functions. If this is just blowing your mind because you've never done reversing anymore, or you have not done reversing yet, that's fine. It, it's cool. It'll make sense one day. Um, but like, here's what that little program looks like. Here's the coolest part. If I mouse over this, there's an if statement at one point, and look, the little if statement branches are all animated. It shows me which direction the oh, program, so right? Cool. Let's watch that again. Yeah. Yeah, I'm digging the dragon theme. It's cool. Anyways, it's free. Um, download it. Try it out. All you need is Java. Um, it supports like multi-user um, debug sessions, which is wild. That's not a thing that other tools have. You can like version control your binary. Like it's cool. I'm still trying to figure out how most of it works, but it's awesome and it's free. So go use it. So good on them, yeah, yep, for being more exactly. open, like you said. And these tools are pretty rare, like they're that are out there. Yeah, like a license for Ida Pro is like six grand, um, and this is oh. free, so yeah. pretty good by research. comparison. So yeah, now more people can do research and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, good for students too. Um, this was another thing. I guess a lot of folks at RSA were talking about what they what they're kind of calling like, the death of the password. Because let's face it, passwords aren't great. People forget them. We put pretty serious constraints on our users. We say, you know, it has to be like uppercase, lowercase, numbers, it has to have a special character. A user says, what's a special character? And you tell them those things you never look at on your keyboard and you're afraid to touch. And then they forget them and then you have to reset them. And it just becomes a whole thing, right? Like people don't like passwords. So, and tell um, them to reset it every 90 days, which is always fun. Yeah, <laughs> password rotation being another pain in the butt, like yeah. I try to avoid. Okay. Um, so a lot of the new um, development work, a lot of the new authentication interfaces are based around leveraging some of the other factors of authentication. So what do you have in terms of fingerprint scanners um, or keys or even like NFC or taps with like your phone or some other token that you might have. And I guess a lot of people were just sort of pushing that message at RSA this year. And that's cool. I mean, um, it's good. It's something that uh, I once heard someone describe as reducing the amount of friction that it takes for a user to log in. And I like that as a description because a lot of security um, hoops that we make our users jump through can be described as friction. It's more effort. It's more work for them to do um, simply for being more secure. So the more of that friction we can remove, the easier we can make it for our users to um, you know, to authenticate safely and securely, the better, because then people will start using those things if they're easier. Ideally, security would be completely transparent to your end user. That things would be secure and they wouldn't even know it. That's, that's a hard goal to reach, um, but the next best is reducing the amount of work that we ask our users to do. So stuff like looking at your phone and getting the facial recognition or touching the fingerprint thing on the back. Those are steps in the right direction. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, and you see that even with, especially with Apple being very user interface, how they really um, brought the ten, like the fingerprint scanner, fingerprint to um, consumer phones and led that initiative. And now with the Face ID, well, it's been been around before, but you know, like after Apple did it, like it became very com much more common. Yeah. And now with the Face ID, they released Face ID, and we saw Android also implement similar features. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's been in the works for years, but. Yeah. They came out of a similar time, so yeah. You're right. Like I used to, I used to rip on biometrics a lot. Like I was pretty anti them for a lot of reasons, but the second I got like Touch ID on my phone and I didn't have to type a password every time to unlock my phone, I was like an instant convert, and I I revoked my previous mm -hmm. words on it because man, is it nice. Oh, absolutely. I was the same with the fingerprint. I was like, no, I don't want someone like getting my fingerprint or something. No. Yeah. No. Way but. way more awesome. In other awesome news, Microsoft open sourced the calculator. Like the calculator in Windows is open source now. Remember like random stuff to get opened up. That's amazing. Yeah, um, just because it, it seems like the most ridiculous piece of software to open source. Um, but it's funny in the InfoSec context too, because if you've ever watched demos of people showcasing Windows exploits, the first thing they do once they exploit the Windows box to prove that they have full control over it is to launch calc.exe. So it's a bit of an inside joke in the security world as well. So the fact that Microsoft open sourced it is, is just like a fun event that occurred that everybody decided to recognize. Um, but 
interesting stuff that folks have discovered while poking through here. There is a, a license, an MIT licensed math library in here that would apparently allow for infinite precision um, in terms of calculations. So like you do a division operation and it could just in theory, you could have that calculate an infinite level of decimal places for you if you wanted. Yeah, and then just like DOS your machine because you're just doing like <laughs> unending calculations. So cool. I mean, I'm totally going to poke yeah. through the source code for Windows Calc because why not? I want to know what kind of calculator Microsoft writes because it's probably going to be really good. It's yeah. just my, my two cents. Time like, to find out all the decimals of pi. Yeah. And we I can mean, do it, guys. Like, what's, <laughs> what's it written in? My guess would be C sharp. Looks like a solutions file. Calculator. Uh, yeah. CP, okay. Uh, C++, that's hardcore. Um, maybe I'll check that out when I have more time because that's yeah, going to take a while to look at. I wonder if there have there been any forks of it or people contributed to it? 970 forks. I see issues though, that's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 8,000 stars. I'm totally going to like star this thing. Yeah, lots of issues. From <laughs> Too slow. <laughs> Has anybody ever launched calculator? Like it's about a second, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. What? I'm pretty sure that's just the UI trying to match your screen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm just gonna read some of those for laughs later. That's yep. gonna, I'm gonna leave in that tab open. And you can use the calculator to keep track. Yeah, <laughs> hmm, hmm, of how many. Uh, which one's this? Oh man, uh, we got a few uh, follow-ups on the Equifax breach from a while back that was really bad. Um, so a Senate, um, American Senate report on it said, wow, not only were they bad, they were really bad because they ignored uh, lots of regular cybersecurity reports that they would receive saying, hey, you have lots of high level critical vulnerabilities in your environment. You need to patch them. And I guess they just kept not doing that. Um, if you've like run stuff like vulnerability scanners before, you know that most of the vulnerabilities you end up finding get categorized into like low, medium, and high. Um, it's not, depending on the scanner, sometimes critical. And apparently they had just a plethora of high and criticals that weren't getting patched. Yep. Um, so. Well, isn't that also the issue in one of our classes you mentioned with secure, with auditing reports, like people will receive them, read them, and then just kind of ignore them for next year? Yeah. Like, yeah, we got, our, we got our audit. We're good. Yeah. Or you sign the box that say, we accept the risk. We've had the report done. I've accepted the risks, and that's that. You move on. Yep. Um, they, I like this, they want to pass laws making it illegal to be so incompetent. Basically <laughs> saying, like, you got to do better if you're going to run a great big organization that houses the data for hundreds of millions of people. Um, you actually have to give a gosh darn about security. Um, so that's good. Um, anytime legislation kind of follows along in an industry that makes people, um, you know, try harder, it's good. Because otherwise it's a hard sell getting people to spend money and have good security programs. So when they're legally required to, it's always a step in the right direction. Right? Like our country, last November, we finally have our mandatory breach reporting legislation. Because before that, you didn't hear about too many Canadian data breaches because we weren't mandated by law to report them. But now that we have this legislation that makes it happen, you're going to start to see more of those things being reported in Canada. So yep. usually compliance follows legislation. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those things. Yeah. Usually usually um, laws get passed when something happens. Yeah, when There's stuff's really bad. Happens and then that's when they pass the law. So yeah. looks like that's happening now. Yep. Good thing. Because they, dra they dragged out the CEO for, from Equifax um, after the breach and asked him and there was a whole stuff about that so oh, yeah. looks like they're getting something from it yep um kind of related to that so because one of the things people use to offset the risk of a great big data breach and not having done their due diligence and locked down in their systems is to buy breach insurance, which you can do from a lot of insurance vendors who will basically pay you money um, to help you recover from the costs that you expend recovering from a data breach or a great big hack. But what happened? Uh, so recently, Zurich American Insurance refused to pay out a hundred million claim from Mondelez um, saying that since the U.S. and other governments labeled the NotPetya attack as an action by the Russian military, they said, well, we have a clause that says, you know, anything that would look like a wartime act, we're not going to pay out on. So now if you can prove that the attack came from like a nation state hacking group, because it might be considered an act of war, now they don't have to pay your data breach claim. And you know that insurance providers will look for any 
artifact or any anything that they can to not pay out a claim. So if they basically suspect that it was a nation state involved in your data breach, your breach insurance is going to do you no good now. So that's a concerning development, I'm sure, for a lot of organizations. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Any other big breach is probably just going to be North Korea or Russia. So <laughs> yeah. Most of the insurance claims are going to be against the big breach is probably going to be a yeah, I mean, nowadays it's basically going to be insurance companies trying to tie it back to, um, yeah, Russia, North Korea, or China, and a company trying to say, no, 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 it was not one of those three nations that breached me. And it's going to be that battle mostly over the insurance payout. That's going to be an interesting thing yeah. to watch evolve, right? It will be unique, and it's like, that's just going to be like, who pays? And no one wants to pay anything. I mean, yeah, no, no, of course, like, places want to save money, but it, how are you going to prove that it was like the basement dwelling hacker? It's kind of shooting yourself in the foot because if you don't, if you get breach protection and you like get hacked by someone, you yeah. want you want that you know like, you're protecting the data. So yeah. But most of the the cyber insurance does not just cover breaches; it covers like property. Oh yeah, there's yeah, there's quite a few insider things. Insider attacks. So yeah. a lot of the claims that are currently being made to the cyber insurance is actually like lost stolen laptop. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Stuff. yeah. Well, so there's certain types there's certain things that as a result of a data breach would actually fall under a company's traditional theft insurance as well. Because theft insurance is different than like insurance covering data breaches, which is meant to be spent on like an incident response team versus theft insurance is is to help prosecute and find um, instances of theft and stuff like that. Uh, Companies have a lot of insurance. That's another thing. If you go and spend a lot of time in a great big org, companies have lots of weird different types of insurance you will discover. And they spend a lot on it. I think there was one talk at Task and they said they recommend in this, like companies spend like 5% of their revenue on insurance yeah. or something like that. I mean, like, I spend yeah, okay, good luck with that. I mean, I spend a lot of my revenue on <laughs> insurance cuz you know, you get home and car and if you have pets, maybe you have pet insurance, which is really expensive. Um, okay, moving along. So some people taught some cameras how to spot shop, shoplifters in stores, and it's a bit sketch. Um, basically, oh, this is just an image. I thought it was a video, sorry. Um, is there a video in this one? No. So there is a video out there of this system working, but basically it flags you, at least from the way it appears in the video, it flags you as a potential shoplifter if you're like standing at a, in front of a shelf doing sketchy stuff like looking down the aisles and like maybe reaching and maybe not and then like looking back at the aisle so if you just kind of stand there it's gonna think you're not a shoplifter but if you're like looking all around then that seems to be how it tags you I don't I don't know how effective this is gonna be Um, it was an interesting video to watch though because as the guy like does in this video as he looks around more you can see it's got this little like risk rating that you can kind of half see where my mouse is pointing, oh, yeah. suspicious right? He's sitting at eighty percent, but then he starts to move around more, and it goes up and up and up. Um, and that's when it basically just flags a store employee to walk by and say, "Do you need a hand, sir?" And he, you know, drops all the stolen merchandise, and you run out of the store and stuff like that. But they use AI. Yeah, well? okay. yeah, because they they basically a like gesture recognition kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, is it infosec? I mean, we talk about loss prevention sometimes, so I guess kind of, sort of. Um, so if anybody wants to go shoplift, just just stand really still as you steal all the stuff. Just like don't turn your body, and then you'll be fine. Not that we ever ad- we don't advocate theft. Yeah, yeah. Just keep staring at the camera. Yeah, <laughs> look, like, just look like stare the camera down. Just like look it right in the eye and just start taking yeah. stuff. Yeah. But this will be good, uh, quite useful for uh, like the Amazon uh, stores. Was it the? Oh yeah, yeah, the pop up stores yeah, the where like they stores. don't have any staff in mm-hmm. little grocery store. That's interesting. Yeah. Chocolate thing. They just know you have it, right? Yeah, and they'll just send you an invoice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, well, come to think of it, though, like this would be awesome in tests. I could just set up cameras in the room, and the second like someone starts looking too much at the adjacent papers, it just flags you. Oh boy! That's That's too. Yeah, yeah. Ca- oh, capstone project right there. <laughs> we want to make me like a a gesture based anti cheat system. Just oh, and if it could spit out the academic integrity write up at the same time, <laughs> <laughs> like save me the forty minutes of filling out forms. That would be amazing. Yeah, printer on front of everyone's test, and then just like it slowly starts printing out. <laughs> 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 yeah, as you're writing, it just keeps on going. They're just like, no. That's amazing. <laughs> it's super slow. It's like, 
So yeah, someone pitched that. We're, do, we're doing it. <laughs> um, this one was interesting. Someone found a way to spoof the digital signatures that can be applied to PDFs. So PDF documents and a number of other electronic document formats can be um, signed in a way that sort of yeah, kind of proves that it was you, or at least that it was your user account on a certain system that applied a digital signature to a document. And some places take these um, types of signatures as valid signatures for contract reasons and stuff like that. Um, I've signed a lot of documents digitally like this when we used to do um, incident response work because you don't have time to print out a document and sign it and scan it and send it back. You're like literally walking to a plane so you just got to be able to open a PDF and apply a signature. Now, someone was saying that they found out a way to um, spoof or forge signatures on um, those documents which has uh, complications and issues that could arise for all kinds of contract law and stuff like that. So yeah. I didn't dig too deep into what the exact vulm is, um, but just being able to... I, I assume it's just a flaw in the crypto implementation because that's what it always is. Yeah. Uh, here they're explaining how the signatures work, the attacks, signature forgery, some kind of saving attack, screwing with parser. Yeah. Wow, it's actually quite... Detail. Yeah, this has been be, uh, adopted pretty well as yeah. well right here. Yeah. So, so neat. Mm. Go read that if you like crypto stuff. I'm sure there's a crypto break in there. Um, CoinHive, which was one of the big crypto mining services um, that had a lot of uh, tie-ins to a lot of the crypto jacking stuff. So you get like the malicious plugin or a uh, website, whatever, that would try to use your resources to mine coin as you're visiting a website uh, is shutting down. Uh, it was used to line, malign, uh, mine a lot of Monero and stuff like that. Um, and a lot of people are saying, well, a lot of security people are um, cheering this on, saying this is a great thing. Um, maybe not so great for the uh, cryptocurrency industry because, um, I mean, that was one interesting business model. So, yep. It's mostly we're cheering because there's going to be less crypto jacking. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if there's no central service to make money off of crypto jacking, then we're going to see a lot less of it. Yeah. Like, that's why we like it. But I'm saying the people that were in favor of the site like that because mm -hmm. um, it was a good business driver for crypto. So, it was just a pool that it was a mining pool? Is that Count, yeah. how do you describe it? Okay. Basically. Yeah. So, uh, I don't, don't actually know why, though. Because I don't think they got shut down, they were shutting down. Yeah, no, I think. Uh, yeah. um, they said that they were making enough money for it to be like hmm. so it just wasn't profitable for them. Yeah, it wasn't profitable anymore. So yeah. Mm, interesting. Mm -hmm. Cool. And I think they were taking a huge chunk of, of that as well. Was it like 30% or something like that? Oh, I don't know. Um, yeah. Interesting. I mean, it's good business. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 30% of the, the cut, yeah. So, like, even, even taking a pretty large chunk, because that was pretty widely distributed, right? So mm -hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So, I mean, yay for not having a rando sketch website use up all your CPU and GPU um, processing. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Bandwidth. Yeah. And it, it, junk they're like not that. using they're not using that much infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're using everybody else. Um, so there was apparently an Ode exploit like in act being actively exploited in the wild for Chrome and everybody freaked out and said patch oh my goodness immediately uh, two days ago. So that's always a big deal because whenever something like that is happening in the wild, you wonder why the bug didn't get sold at something like the Pwn to Own contest or through one of those other things. So someone obviously has been exploiting this and probably at some point made a lot of money off it, uh, which is always scary. Um, did I read this one? I forget. I forget what the CVE is all about. And it's with the Chrome oh. web browser in yep. particular? or is the, It's um, Chrome, not Chromium. With yeah, Chrome? yeah okay. the actual the forked version there it is so a uh, use after free vulnerability in the file reader component okay. uh, could enable unprivileged attackers to gain privileges on the Chrome web browser allowing them to escape the sandbox protections and run arbitrary code on the target system that kind of stuff is like the the nightmare of IT departments today because if it's in a web browser and it's remote code execution that means in theory all it takes is for your user to visit a website to have their machine compromised and then bad guy has foothold inside your network. That's why it's terrifying. So uh, yeah, that's why uh, updates are a good thing. I mean, luckily Chrome updates pretty often, so you don't have to worry too much, but yep. yeah, updates, that's the thing. Uh, so I guess as a bit of a, um, yeah, we're not the only ones thing. Um, Google's Project Zero team released a high severity flaw for Mac OS 
Um, I think it was just some sort of, oh, it's a weird one. Um, so it's a privilege, it's kind of could allow for access to protected memory through um, a flaw in the copy on write functionality when you're manipulating disk images, which is a really specific case. This would be like a small part of a larger exploit chain that would probably help you take over um, a machine. So yeah, if anybody is in OS, no, you would have had OS last semester, talked about um, copy on write optimization and stuff like that. It's a, like a low level um, operation in OS uh, functionality. So cool, um, let's patch. Um, Pack, always patch. Yep. Do that. A um, couple of other cool tool releases from RSA. Um, we're going to do Google and Microsoft back to back. So first off, Google uh, released Backstory, which is their sort of new cloud-based cybersecurity threat analysis monitoring platform um, for people. There's a video, but you know it's got all the standard stuff. Like you import data into it, it shows you graphs and tries to help you determine if your network's been compromised. Um, it's probably good. I don't know, our resident SIM guy, have you looked into it at all? No, fair enough. The Microsoft, okay, so you can chime in on the next story. Um, but, I mean, if it's Google, it's probably okay. Yep, it's built off of Google's uh, cloud infrastructure, Google's infrastructure, and apparently they optimized it for um, very fast searches, hmm. if I remember correctly, so. Cool. Yeah. So quick reporting. Neat. Yep. That'd be cool and to check out. you can go back uh, very far. I think, uh, yeah, it's supposed to it's store supposed a lot to of data. Store a lot of data, and you can go back farther, and it's. It, it, it depends on how much you want to pay. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, you're paying yeah. for. Uh, they said they're, you're paying for user per user, mm -hmm. and then uh, data. I'm not sure if they put a limit on the data, mm -hmm. but they said they they're for, they said they're going to be charging per user, not necessarily per data. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have all the storage space in the world. So, um, yeah. I guess they're they're integrating some threat intel feeds from some of the other providers. Mm -hmm. um, so that's yeah. kind of cool. Yeah, looks neat. Maybe they'll have a free tier for school. Let's <laughs> let's cross our fingers. Um, so other people doing cool stuff. Microsoft also launched their well. They launched two big products. Um, so one was again a a version of a security incident and event management kind of tool uh, that lives inside Microsoft Azure. So again, cloud based. Um, but then they released another one that we'll talk about in a second, but first over again to SimGuy if you want to talk about the Microsoft one, if you looked at it much. Uh, so essentially it's pretty much your normal basic Sim. The only difference is that it uses uh, Perl to create the rules. So it's, it's very close to being able, well, one of their special features is that you can program AI or machine learning into your rules so that it can start learning patterns more than just like anomaly detection, which is just that's cool. Uh, looking at like, uh, patterns of users, but with machine learning, you can tell it to look for uh, for patterns it might not have seen yet. Mm -hmm. And it, it really is look looking to look like it could be a good sim solution. It mm -hmm. just now we have to see how like performance is. Yeah. Yeah. Which I'm sure, you know, after it's been out for a little while, maybe we'll start to see some reports on if it's any good. That's cool. Um, so I guess, though, then as a contrast to that, the other service they released is basically a what they call like a, an expert something or other, where threat experts. So this one's actually more person driven. So maybe it's to complement the results that the other system pull out. Then they, I guess they have just have teams of people to sit and go over the data. Because we're obviously good at certain types of analysis and AI and algorithms and stuff like that are good at other types of analysis. So I guess the idea is to have two service offerings that kind of um, uh, work well together in that, that regard. Like a service yeah, it is. Oh, yeah. MSP yeah, it's a whole separate, yeah, it's probably just um, their managed service uh, for doing this kind of data. And it integrates with uh, Defender. With Windows Defender? Yep. Okay, nice. Yeah, because yeah, Windows Defender, they did a decent job with, with it. So. Mm -hmm. so then it's coming with its own endpoint solution as well. Yeah. yeah. Ask a threat expert button in the Windows Defender Security Center. That's amazing. <laughs> so now I can do like live chat, but in like for security questions. That's awesome. Okay. Um, that should be interesting. For business use only. Yeah, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure everybody will be named like Steve. <laughs> You're talking to Steve from our security team. Neat. Um, so I always like when you know big new cool products get released. Um, like, again, having been 
inside a few security ops centers, they all have these giant, oh, cool, look at all these, like, maps thing. Yeah, nobody on this team ever looks at this. This is so that when they walk people past the room, that, like, the guests go, ooh, look at all those big dashboards. Like, I've seen that in Mission Impossible or some other movie that has a big, like, central ops center. Yeah, because, ha- look, look at this. Okay, so we got, like, some parts of the U.S., highlighted in this map is that like brazil right there a bit of australia yeah Yeah, like what is how is this actionable to somebody they go oh yeah america's still on the map cool like (laughs) (laughs) yeah there's packets moving on the internet um which uh i know paris and canada is basically just dead yeah i mean that's about as good as threatbutt's attack map if you've ever seen the threatbutt attack map the it's pretty much this. Up is just for, uh, for tourists to, to look at, yeah. Because we have, like, confidential Yeah. This is... There's a better one. The one that, like, goes down and it's, like, plain mode. It's yeah. Like oh, yeah, there's some great ones out there. Although, and I wish I had saved the URL for it. For International Women's Day, um, Threatbutt made um, a different threat map that's, like, pink instead. Um, this is a, by the way, if you didn't know, this is a joke threat map. It just makes up stuff like, I don't know, uses netcat against URY. It's super effective. Like, it's a joke, right? Um, that's poking fun at all these dashboards that don't actually show you anything useful. Oh, okay, um, okay. But funny. Uh, moving along. Yet another hardware volume from uh, Intel CPUs. Not great. Um, Intel's not getting a break. Nope. Um, this one, I'm gonna be honest though, I, I did not read up on this yet. I just know that there was uh, one release that's like kind of related to Spectre, but I don't know if anybody else read further on this one this week. Um, I just didn't get to this. Anybody? No? All right, let's, let's read the first paragraph. <laughs> uh, oh, boffins have found another way to abuse speculative execution in Intel's CPUs to steal secrets and other data running from applications. So I guess same as last time, um, issues with branch prediction in architecture, so where it tries to guess which code you're gonna run, and in relation to that, it loads stuff into memory that you might need. And then in certain circumstances, you can then read that stuff that was maybe loaded into memory, and that might be valuable to you because stuff in protected regions of memory are useful for things like exploits and extracting data and stuff like that. So more issues with branch prediction. This is an ongoing problem, I guess. Trying to make stuff really, really fast, you have security sacrifices you have to uh, accept and deal with. So, yeah. Uh, great, great graphic, though, they chose for the thing. Like This guy's just sick of hearing about Intel exploits, I guess. <laughs> That's cool. Oh, this one was uh, building on a story from two weeks ago. So Quadriga CX, which was a Canadian um, cryptocurrency exchange, um, two weeks ago we were reporting that the CEO who held a lot of the offline wallet keys had died. And everyone was like, wow, that seems kind of sketch. And then I guess a bunch of auditors had like escrow on those keys, meaning they could recover the keys for those wallets. So the auditors went through the stuff, got the escrow keys, and then went to those offline cold storage wallets and found that they were all empty. So all, like that 200, and, was it $230 million worth of, uh, 190 million Canadian, so like eight bucks American, worth of cryptocurrency was already gone by the time they got there. So that's extra sketch. This could turn into like uh, a really cool movie plot, like guy fakes his own death, steals all the money. Hopes yeah. nobody is ever going to find out. Goes to India first, then dies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. He didn't die in Canada. Pardon me? He didn't die in Canada. So uh, that part I don't know. Did he uh, go to India first? He went, or to, he went to India and then it was reported that he died. Yeah. 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 I guess so. Okay. Right. Yeah, this is going to be an awesome. If they find out more, like this is going to turn into a cool story, even cooler than it already is. Yeah. It's going to be turning into a movie. Yeah, no, this could totally be a Bitcoin drama movie. There's oh, a mini series on Netflix called oh, And Then the Keys is. Were Gone or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be Are you gonna see so. From this team? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'll make a deal with y'all. If they turn this into a Netflix miniseries, we'll like we'll watch it in here as a great big oh, group of people. It'll be so yeah. fun on these comfortable chairs. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hmm? Yeah. No, we're Netflix marathon and crypto. Obviously, yeah. we'll do it right. Yeah. We'll marathon it. <laughs> uh, moving along, uh, Citrix, which uh, makes a lot of like kind of remote desktop y remote environment uh, stuff for users, found out that they got hacked pretty bad. Lots of data got accessed. I mean, saying six terabytes doesn't tell me too much other than it was probably just all of their data. Um, yeah, among more than 200 government agencies hit by cyber gang. Yeah, like a lot of people use Citrix for a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> warned us that foreign hackers romped through its internal company network and stole corporate secrets. Whatever that might mean. Uh, I guess that's about as detailed as we can get right now. Um, I guess, although they've maybe already pinned it on Iran, or Citrix's insurance provider has already pinned it on Iran, because then no payout, right? from earlier right that's that's a callback joke you're supposed to <laughs> laugh at that i guess not eh? all right cool well speaking of uh of uh, hmm. penetration testers ceiling computers yeah here awesome. it comes again so Although this guy stole a few more a couple more yeah. than the other guy so it guy us fraud watchdog stole 16 computers from the fraud watchdog service and i guess they found them on ebay awesome Good insider threat. That's the thing. Happens a lot. Um, it's the like probably the majority of cases that I did when I worked in forensics were insider threat at organizations that hired us to like look into their own people. Uh, it happens. Um, so people just want to make a buck. I guess this guy was just trying to sell these things. Yeah. On eBay. Yeah. Just for yeah. yeah. yeah that's not <laughs> Okay. Yeah, and they listen to the specs there and whatnot. Oh boy. Well, the thing is with these laptops, they have a very short shelf life. Yeah. That they have that they're worth yeah. worth a decent decent amount. So yeah, I guess he's kind of stuck. Yeah. So I guess track your assets. Know what's what. The question is, did he get any money out of them before they got them? Like, oh, I already have eight left. I mean, hey, if he was, they must have known that he sold a few because if he was selling them for two thousand twenty one a piece, he must have sold a few of them. Because like that's the th okay so here's here's a random forensic story. Um, one thing that was true again and again and again is organizations never tended to notice stuff like this until bad guy gets greedy, right? Like one or two, and nobody ever seemed to notice this kind of stuff. It was when people started doing stupid things like embezzling like twenty thousand dollars at a time, and that's when people started to notice and would call the forensic firms in and stuff like that. Um, it, it happens. Bad guy gets lazy, they get greedy, um, and then that's when they get caught. Um, which, like we always say in forensics, we never catch the smart ones because there's so many idiots out there that kept us busy like all the time. Yeah, exactly. What do we expect one or two to break? To disappear? Uh, yeah. Cool. With most of our clients, every time we ask for an access list, usually they don't. Oh, like an asset list, you mean? Or an access? Asset list? Asset. Yeah, yeah. So like hardware that they own, a list of software they, they Nobody have. manages this stuff. And it's like item number one. Just keep an inventory yeah. of well, what you, you got. Computer, for example, the very first thing, just store the entire domain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, so unless anybody's got any other news that they saw, I want to bring it up. That's about it for news. And we'll, so we'll have a quick break while I make a brand new account on Ring Zero um, so we can solve the intro level challenges. We will do that. Uh, other stories? Anybody see anything cool? No. Awesome. Yeah, Google like, zero day attacks making them around. So like when it was cell phones on in, like somebody like logged on and posted it in the group and it's like, oh my god, it's like and oh, then, like, the, the Chrome one you mean? Like, yeah, just kind of oh yeah. Like, yeah. It it was like an easy fix, but terrifying at the same time, for sure. Okay. So uh I will pause this.